Ever wonder what psychologists talk about over coffee? I'm Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, where I specialize in rehab and health psychology and acceptance and commitment therapy. And I'm Diana Hill, a clinical psychologist in CSI in Santa Barbara, California, where I specialize in mindfulness and values-based approaches to therapy. In this podcast, we bring psychology research into practice by discussing topics from psychology with experts in the field and with each other. You'll get a glimpse into the books we read, the research we think is interesting, and the ideas from psychology that we use to thrive in our own lives. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, Diana. Hey, Debbie. So today we're going to be talking about anxiety. You have a great interview ahead. Um, Let's start by just talking about anxiety. Are there things that make you anxious, Diana? Yes, I'm human. So there's lots of things that make me anxious. And, you know, I was thinking about it. What's funny is that two things make me really anxious on a regular basis. And one is calling new potential clients back. I always get a little Mm -hmm. bit anxious making that phone call. And the other is meeting with a family for the first time for family therapy. That always makes me anxious. I have, to plan, uh, I have to plan my outfit ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, that's about the only thing you can plan because there's that unknown quality. Exactly. Right? What about yeah. you? What, what makes you anxious? You know, something that always makes me so anxious is I get slightly anxious about driving. Um, I mean, not really myself as much, but when my kids are driving on the highway with someone and I'm not there, yeah. I feel really worried about them. And so I get this anxiety around it. And I always kind of toy with the idea of not letting them go somewhere. Yeah. Um, it terrifies me. Yeah. yeah. And, and John Forsyth, who we're going to interview today, who wrote the book, Anxiety Happens, talks a lot about the costs of avoiding anxiety. So if we think about those two things that we're anxious about, if you were to avoid ever having anyone drive your kids, that would cause a lot of problems in your life. Uh, oh, yeah. They wouldn't get as much as many opportunities to do fun things with their grandparents. And yeah, they, I, I feel like that would be at a big cost to them. Yeah. Some opportunity and for you too, for your practice. Right. If I never called a new client back, I wouldn't have a practice. <laughs> you, you would have no practice to yeah. speak of. That yeah. would be a big cost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk today with John Forsyth and he's going to give us a lot of information about the ACT approach for anxiety. And I think you'll really uh, like this interview, and I certainly found it helpful for myself personally and my own anxiety of client, calling clients back, but also in working with uh, many individuals who struggle with anxiety as well. Great. I can't wait to hear it. And tell us, you have an upcoming ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Workshop in Santa Barbara. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. It's the last weekend of May on Sunday, May 27th from 1 to 4. And it's held at Yoga Soup, which is the sweetest yoga studio downtown Santa Barbara. You could make a lovely day of it, of go to the workshop and then hit up a chocolate at Chocolate Maya and get a little backyard bowls. It's really lovely, the environment there. And it's a workshop for everybody. So it's for mental health professionals, I am offering CEUs, uh, and but not for psychologists, for MFTs and LCSWs, and it, psychologists can attend. But it's also for the general public, and it's the first time I've ever done an acceptance and commitment therapy workshop for the public. It's going to be very experiential, and I hope that uh, you can all everyone can attend. So you can sign up for it at yogasoup.com, or you can sign up for it uh, by getting to yogasoup.com through my website, which is drdianahill.com. Great. Well, if people like what they hear today about acceptance and commitment therapy, your training is a great, th- a great place to learn more. Yes, and to practice those skills. Okay, great. Here is John Forsyth. John Forsyth is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and trainer in the use of acceptance and commitment therapy and practices to cultivate mindfulness, loving kindness, and compassion. For over 20 years, his work has focused on developing ACT and mindfulness practices to alleviate human suffering, awaken the human spirit, and to nurture psychological health and vitality. He's written several popular ACT books, including Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Anxiety Disorders, which is for mental health professionals, and four self-help books for the public, The Mindfulness and Acceptance Workbook for Anxiety, Act on Life, Not on Anger, Your Life on Purpose, and the book that we'll be discussing today, which is Anxiety Happens, 52 Ways to Find Peace of Mind. 
Dr. Forsyth holds a doctorate in clinical psychology and is a professor of psychology and director of the Anxiety Disorders Research Program at the University at Albany SUNY in upstate New York. He's also a widely sought after ACT trainer and consults and serves as senior editor of the ACT book series with New Harbinger Publications. He regularly gives talks and workshops to the public and professionals in the United States and abroad. And he's actually going to be uh, in California soon, up in Northern California, where he'll be giving an ACT workshop at Esalen and Big Sur. So welcome, Dr. Forsyth. We're really, really grateful to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me, Dan. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah. And one of the, the places that I was hoping that we could start is just a little bit about your history and why you've really dedicated your research and clinical work to the treatment of anxiety. What drew you to this this topic in particular? Well, uh, I started out uh, in in the field thinking that I was going to uh, simply go into uh, like social work practice actually at one time. <laughs> and uh, through an internship uh, that I had at the National Center for PTSD in Boston, I realized I loved research and also studying trauma. Uh, became uh, very interested in the factors that would lead somebody to um, develop an anxiety problem. Um, and uh, so as a graduate student, understanding that, you know, anxiety is everywhere, that it was perfectly adaptive, that we, our ancestors needed it to survive. It's what kept us from being lunch by predators. Um, I really became curious is what's the difference then if anxiety is so common, what turns anxiety on its head and makes it a life shattering problem? So um, knowing it's widespread that everybody on this planet experiences it, but not everyone suffers uh, with an anxiety disorder. I really set out to try to, to understand why that's so. Um, so that's been really my abiding interest in that um, itself. So. so of course that makes me curious. Why is that so? What have you discovered in your research? Uh, well, that led me on a journey in a like a professional journey, but also a personal one, to uh, explore what the science had to say. And and you know, I come from a, a behavioral background and a cognitive behavioral background. And you know, within those approaches, there's a heavy emphasis, I think, on teaching people better ways to uh, change their thinking and change their emotions as if that was the solution. And there's another wing from behavioral psychology that was suggesting that the problem is not what we think and feel. The problem is our relationship with what we think and feel, which is parts of our own history. And that, it seems now with more science, is turning out to be a, a key factor in what takes normal anxiety and fear from just being an unpleasant experience that just about everybody will have uh, to something that can literally cause enormous suffering. Um, so it's, it's not just, you know, having anxiety, it's also our relationship with that emotion and the thoughts and the images and the judgments that circle and around that. And can you tell me a little bit about how you how you became an ACT therapist? What was your road to to becoming more interested in ACT in particular? Well, this happened again when I was in graduate school, being trained in uh, cognitive behavior therapy and uh, starting to study anxiety. I was also being exposed to this other kind of uh, form of science and way of thinking from applied behavior analysis. And there were people there like uh, Stephen Hayes who were talking about a, an approach called, at that time, called comprehensive distancing. So this is what ACT was called before it was formally called ACT. Mm -hmm. And that approach was so different than what I was hearing in traditional CBT, which was very much about managing and controlling unpleasant thoughts and feelings. And in and the comprehensive distancing was talking instead about changing our relationship with our mind or language and cognition, our feelings. And 
instead of changing what we think and feel, changing our relationship with what we think and what we feel, which are really, from that perspective, products of our history. You know, we're historical creatures. And even modern neuroscience teaches us that our nervous systems are additive, not subtractive. So what that means is what goes in stays in, short of brain insult and injury. So knowing that we carry this history, and some of it's pleasant, some of it's unpleasant, and so on, and that that may show up by in certain situations and contexts, when it does show up, it's at, at the comprehensive distancing or now act really looking at like, well, how do we stand with this stuff that we carry? Are we at war with it? Are we open and diffused with it and gentle with it? Um, does it serve us well? Like if we listen to it, like our thoughts, um, sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Um, so it wasn't just the presence of you know, what people call catastrophic thinking or automatic thinking or dysfunctional thoughts or schemas. And it's about our relationship with this stuff and whether it's useful in the service of the kind of life we wish to lead or not. So it's a very different approach. It's not about changing what's there. Um, it's actually about renegotiating our relationship with what's there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've certainly had many times the experience of a client in my office saying that they they know that their thought is, quote, irrational, but it still dictates their behavior. Like, it still runs the show. And so if you can kind of uncouple the behavior from the thought a little bit and have some, it makes sense, comprehensive distancing, make a little distance between the two, then you have some more freedom, is what sort of you're alluding to. Yeah, yeah, and that's I think a key piece that you know even even the way you phrase that like I, the thought is irrational. Right. Like what's what's hard for us to see sometimes is that itself is a judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, like I've had clients say, "Oh, my obsessional thoughts," and we would step back after doing some of this work and ask, "I just noticed that you know you you called your thoughts obsessional. There is that helpful? Mm -hmm. You know, in the sense of what you want to be about. Does that?" help you to do more with your life or less. So it wasn't, it's the way we actually language, it's so funny, it creeps in there and we start to buy into like categorizing and labeling and judging. And so, yeah, it really does come down to, you know, irrational or not, a thought is a thought. And the question that ACT would ask is, is that useful in the service of your life, your values, what you want to be about as a person? Is it a useful signpost going forward? So what are some of the strategies that you teach in the book, Anxiety Happens, for anxious thoughts to help with some of that distancing? Yeah, so the, so the uh, book itself is, is broken out into uh, 52 like bite-sized chapters that covers a number of teachings and strategies that are based on ACT and the research base there, but also other uh, related strands of work like gratitude, the science inside of gratitude and self-compassion. Uh, but basically, uh, there are several strategies we go after there because, you know, as human beings, we tend to see the world through our thoughts. And there's no way to notice if a thought is helpful or not unless we can actually practice stepping back and looking at it, right? So, like, we have a lot of practice looking at our world from uh, a certain perspective, like we, you can look around your office and see a picture or you can see your desk and other things that are there. And we can learn to do the same thing with our thoughts, which can be liberating because if we can look at them, then we can't be them. And as we practice to look at our thoughts, like we look at other things, we can then ask questions from that perspective, like looking at that thought, is that thought useful? You know, do I need to buy into that thought? Is it helpful in, in going in the direction I want to go? Or does it keep me stuck and limited or maybe even feed our uh, suffering? So uh, a pot, there are several strategies we go through. There are very simple strategies. Um, so one of, uh, one of them, you know, I think that uh, can seem awkward at first, but it's actually very powerful would be to when you do have a thought that's difficult is to pause for a moment and preface it with I'm having the thought that. 
So when somebody says, I can't do this, it seems so rock solid and, and life seems impossible. It's just a pause and then repeat the thought, but this time preface it with I'm having the thought that I can't do this, mm -hmm. which is actually a more honest description of what's going on. You know, you're having a thought. Uh, some of the other exercises we have in there um, include, you, we call one humanizing the mind, and this is one that my uh, wife actually created, where we you take that anxious mind and we kind of pull it out of our heads and we give it a personality. You know, we, we talk about like, you know, what is it, what does this mind look like? How old is it? What is it wearing? What's its tone of voice? You know, is it harsh, criti critical, judgmental, defeating, or is it kind, gentle, supportive? So we walk through just like you describe a person. And then from that perspective, so when you look at this mind, this character that's bullying you around and telling you how to run your life, are they giving you useful advice? So are they somebody you'd want to listen to and go have coffee with? And so... That could actually be humorous, but it also gives people the space to make different choices. Mm -hmm. So instead of those thoughts being inside our head, we're, we're kind of pulling them out and looking at them from a perspective. Uh, and those are just a couple of the exercises we have. Um, you know, some of them is just putting thoughts on cards or on paper. If a simple uh, thing to keep in mind is that if uh, you can put, write it down, you know you're dealing with a thought. So that includes imagery as well. You can draw it. And if you can put it on paper and look at it and ask yourself what you see, and you can do that with many different thoughts, what you will find is you know, the thought that you're, you're hungry, the thought that you're tired, the thought that you might panic, the thought that you might make a fool of yourself. If you write those down and look at them, all of them are made up of the same stuff on the paper, words, letters, and ink. Right. Mm -hmm. So and even if I said I'm a banana and I put it down, mm -hmm. the th now the th it doesn't mean that thoughts don't have associations with different emotions and experiences. So some might have a little bit of a sting to them, mm -hmm. but all thoughts are the same stuff. And so from that perspective of looking at it on the paper, now instead of having it up pressed to your nose, you can actually look at it. And then you could start to ask questions like, what is my relationship with this thought? Am I at war with it? Is it something that I absolutely cannot have? Um, is it helpful in the service of me living my life the way I wish to? Or is it limiting? Mm -hmm. And if it's limiting, then the practice is to allow it to come and go. Because we can learn to do that. You know, our mind produces thousands of thoughts every day. And and we don't need to buy into all of them, especially if they're not helpful. So that's the skill and the practice. And it does take some commitment, but it does, again, free people from like the tyranny of our minds and our history and uh, allows people to move even with these thoughts mm -hmm. that may seem difficult. Like you can have the thought that this is scary or I might humiliate myself and take it with you and go to the party. You know, so that's probably what life is asking of us, but it can be hard if the thoughts take over and run the show, which is often what you see happen when people get mired down with anxiety. So, Right. And one of the, the times that I find anxiety can be um, its most vicious and the biggest struggle is often at night. And when I'm working with clients who struggle with anxiety at night, it seems like they have a lot of um, the cognitive diffusion or the distancing uh, approaches with thoughts can feel really hard to do. Thoughts can be pretty convincing in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. Do you have any, mm. do you have any uh, strategies for when thoughts feel like they're just completely real and true and taking over? Well, I think, look, that's a, that's an experience that many people talk about. I've been there. I think mm. uh, many people have been there with that. Um, and I think it can be really helpful to take a breath and to remind yourself again 
that this is what your this is just your mind doing what it does that not all thoughts need to be trusted or believed it can help maybe to, to get up if you're already awake and just put them on paper journal about them and remind yourself what's on the page what am i really dealing with you know words letters ink mm-hmm. <laughs> right and uh to just allow them to come and go like one exercise we have in in the book is is called uh, mind watching where uh, the exercise is imagining with eyes closed your mind is this medium-sized white room and there are two doors on either side and the thoughts come in one door and then they leave the other door and so they'll leave if we uh, if we take a perspective of watching Right. Mm-hmm. It with some dispassionate interest, some compassion. It's just to watch the thoughts come. It almost sounds like counting sheep. Right. But it's yeah. in a way it's not, you know, it's to it's to not engage the thoughts that are trying to hook us, um, because often the ones that are menacing or sticky, sometimes I'll call them like sticky thoughts or they want to hook us in and draw us in and we want to like kind of chew on it and recycle it and what if it and, you know, go around all the different permutations instead of just noticing there's the thought entering the white room, familiar thought. Sometimes I'll ask people how old that thought is and many people will say it's very old, Mm -hmm. like years. And then I might go further and say if that thought was like, you know, a food item in your in your kitchen cabinet would it be appetizing given <laughs> given how, now they they can't pick a twinkie because you know twinkie has a long shelf life yeah. but most people say oh they'll laugh they'll say it's yucky it's got mold on it so maybe we can just notice that and just allow it to come in the white room and then and then pass and if we practice that you'll see that many thoughts come and go not just the difficult ones and we don't have to buy into all of them. And that's, so that's the practice. Uh, and obviously not forcing sleep, you know, sleep, going to sleep is not a, there's no light switch for going to sleep. So, right. you know, you have to have good sleep hygiene and, you know, be ready for sleep, but also to uh, catch yourself when you're getting hooked into this train of thinking that it, it does more to ramp you up than to settle you down and paradoxically just watching you know just like you watch other things like maybe like clouds in the sky if we watch them we will notice that the clouds come and go but the sky is always there and that sky is that you that can notice despite our emotional weather and what our mind does there's a you there like the sky that's always there that can notice and yeah, it's trying to push those thoughts out the door and getting all, you know, <laughs> you know, the effort to get them from one side to the other just gets you more entangled in them. And I think that's often what happens when we're trying to fall asleep is we just want to go to sleep and, and solve the problems so that we go to sleep, but then we just get deeper and deeper into it. So, which, which also links to the, the concept of avoidance and the role that that plays in maintaining anxiety. Can you talk a little bit about avoidance and how... Uh, it's sort of paradoxical paradoxical effects with anxiety. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, avoidance is everything, I think. Now, it's mm-hmm. it doesn't mean avoidance is bad because, again, like sometimes it's useful. Like if a car was swerving at you and you're walking on the sidewalk, it makes sense to get out of the way, you know, because it protects you. But the avoidance we're talking about often with anxiety is that when it shows up, and this is actually supported by our culture that says it's not okay to feel what you feel and think what you think, uh, especially if it's unpleasant. So you need to do something about it. You need to cope with it, make it go away, distract, medicate, um, not go to different places, avoid certain situations that might make you think and feel anxious. Mm -hmm. So the science is pretty clear on this, and the message is simple. And people, if your listeners have probably heard this, what you resist persists. And in ACT, we speak of uh, if you don't want it, you've got it. So the more you try not to think about it, something that makes you anxious, the more you are thinking about something that makes you anxious. Like there's just no way to not have a thought without thinking it. It's like um, trying not to think about a pink elephant. 
right? It, it is itself a thought about a pink elephant, right? So what avoidance does, and I think this is the key part of it, is that um, often we get trapped in sort of rigid and inflexible patterns of avoidance. So think of it this way, all this effort and energy going in to not thinking certain thoughts, remembering certain memories, feeling certain feelings or bodily sensations, all that energy and effort into that is energy, attention and effort away from the kind of life you wanna lead, the kind of person you wanna become, right? And it's literally warfare. And this is why we use that, um, me the metaphor of the tug of war most people would be familiar with that, you know, as kids, you know, playing the game of tug of war. When you play that game, you're literally dug in, your hands are gripping that rope, your feet are dug in, you can't really move much except pull and try to win the battle. And here with, with anxiety, many people get into the tug of war with what we call the anxiety monster. And they're trying to beat it, you know, uh, finally win, but it, they end up frustrated and exhausted and tired and they never really win that battle because part of it is a battle with our own emotional life and our own history right mm -hmm. so in instead of warfare we actually invite people to explore the possibility like what if you decided to drop the rope you know and notice what that feels like your hands are free you could move around with your feet your attention is, is freed up. And suppose that was difficult. And suppose I said, I've got some, someone or something on the sidelines watching you in this battle with your anxiety, waiting for you to finish it. And they're waiting for you. Maybe it's your child waiting for a bedtime story or it's your friends wanting to go out and have dinner, right? Would you be willing to drop the rope so that you could engage that person or activity? And most people will drop the rope. Mm -hmm. Now, the anxiety doesn't go away simply because we drop the rope. But what that does is it gives us freedom. And so this book actually teaches people how to drop the rope. Because all of us get pulled in tug of wars now and then. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just happens. You know, it, it happens to the best of us. I'm not, because I wrote a book, I'm not <laughs> immune from the pull of anxiety and fear but I've learned in, in that tug of war is to remind myself that I don't need to, to win this fight. I can put my energy and attention into something else. So the whole, there's a huge science behind this emotion thought suppression um, typically backfires. And so we actually feel worse and our lives get smaller. And so that's why avoidance is um, a key piece um, to address. And the other reason I want to bring that up, uh, if we have time here, is, is the pain and difficulty around anxiety often shows up precisely in areas that we care about. Mm -hmm. So if this was something like, I saw you putting your hand over a hot stove, I would say, hey, pull back and, and walk away. That could hurt you. And there'd be no real costs. But when the anxiety shows up around your family or intimate relationships or taking a trip or going to work or driving in your car or it shows up uh, at the supermarket or the mall or when you're outside alone or at home alone and you're wanting to do something that's important to you, that anxiety shows up right there. When you walk away from the anxiety, you also walk away from your life and you walk away from things that you care about. It's almost like they're pasted up against each other. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where people see the costs often is that, you know, if it was just anxiety, I would say, you know, there's no law in the universe that <laughs> says you have to, uh, you know, have it out of your life. And we know that's actually uh, probably not a good idea, but it becomes a problem because the avoidance, because it shows up, in those areas that matter to us. And so when we try to avoid the anxiety there, we also avoid, avoid living our lives. Right. And you, in the book, you walk people through an exercise of listing all the costs of the anxiety, how it's costed them in terms of their relationships with family and friends and financial costs and career costs. And mm -hmm. it seems that that's such an important way to start the process of um, being willing to to 
drop the rope because <laughs> you have to have a reason why. Like you said, you have to have something on the sidelines that you want to go to instead of yeah. being stuck in the tug of war. Yeah, and and that's it. With a co- with going through the costs is just not a, a you know masochistic exercise because mm-hmm. some people often say I already know the costs. Right. You know, I know what it's cost me. But often what it is is people see anxiety. They see the presence of anxiety and fear as costly. Mm -hmm. So like I would never say to somebody you should like it. In fact, in the book, you know, we're pretty clear on that. It's like we're not asking you to like it. Um, But if they step beyond the feeling and look to what they do about it, that's what we're really getting at. It's like all those avoidance moves, all those ways to manage, cope, get rid of, control. We want them to see that those all that energy and effort there is actually has costs associated with it too. Mm-hmm. And it's those things that start to shrink our lives and limit us. So if one way you want to control your anxiety is uh, not to go shopping at the mall, um, then maybe you're not positioned to buy the gift you want for a loved one or a friend. You're not able to go to that neat restaurant. You're not able to get clothes for yourself or to see new things. Um, there are costs inside of that move of not going. And that is, so that's what we want people to really kind of see is that, and it turns out that that's where we have a lot of control, our behavior, right? So whether we fight and avoid or whether we learn to respond to anxiety differently and perhaps even take it with us. Um, but there's no way to do that if if we are set on trying to avoid it and get rid of it because people could use the exercises in this book as another uh, shovel except maybe now it's a gold shovel to try to manage and get rid of their anxiety and what we want them to see is that is really not to trust us but to look at their own experience does managing and controlling and trying to get rid of it is that working for you Mm -hmm. or is it costing you if it's costing you maybe we should let go of that agenda and that's hard because our culture teaches us, you know, if you feel bad, you should make make it go away instead of helping us to learn a different way of relating to that stuff. You know, the stuff that we don't like very much that bubbles up within us, that gets triggered by our environment. Um, and to not avoid it, to actually maybe open up to it with some gentleness and curiosity letting go of the rope and maybe even learning to take it with us just like a tantruming two-year-old you know you know the anxiety might protest you know say hey you know you have to listen to me um but we can learn to carry it with us Mm -hmm. um and there's freedom in that i think yeah i think i i always experience sort of a like a soul sadness when someone comes in who's really been struggling with anxiety for a long time and then goes through and tells me about all the areas of their life that they can't do things in because mm-hmm. of their anxiety and sort of has structured their life in a way that, you know, can't sit next to this person and I can't go out at this hour. And I, you know, all these ways in which trying to prevent the anxiety from happening and the anxiety is just still running the show. It's completely dictating their whole life's path. And that um, there, there is cost, like you said, it's not the cost of the anxiety, it's the cost of what you've had to do to manage, the, what you're doing to manage the anxiety. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, I worked with somebody who um, was deathly afraid of flying and, uh, and basically uh, had told the story where he was with his family and uh, they got, he decided to go on the plane, but then... Uh, he felt so anxious that he decided to leave. This was going to be a family trip. And, and so he, he saw the disappointment in his kids and he vowed that he would, there, there were the costs right there, not just that, but the cost to his freedom and time, uh, much, much uh, easier to get across the country in a plane than it is driving. And um, so he vowed to, to make different choices. And uh, on another trip uh, to a beach area, there was, there were helicopter tours and he took his son in one hand and he took his anxiety in the other mm-hmm. and he brought them on the helicopter and he did it three times. Wow. 
And uh, so he said, yeah, I decided I'm not going to let this bully me and run my life. I'm going to bring it with me. And he did it with compassion. And uh, he said it, it changed everything. So it's it's that that part often even even the way you said it, you know, I can't do this because of the anxiety. Mm-hmm. And that sets up a trap because there's no way you either have to stop wanting to do what you want to do or the anxiety has to go away first. Mm-hmm. So that sets us right back up for struggle. And so that's more thoughts that I would maybe ask somebody to look at. When we get into those, I can't do this because of the anxiety, because of the panic, because of the fear, because of the uh, stress, because of whatever emotion or thought, is to ask, Is that's another thought to step back and ask, is that helpful? Mm-hmm. You know, um, and... Uh, you know, whose life is this? You know, when and sometimes I'll ask people, when you turn it over to anxiety and let anxiety run your life, what happens? Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? And many people who are in the, uh, have a history of lots of struggle kind of uh, with resistance with anxiety will say it, it's gotten smaller. I mean, I'd be, the, I'd be the first one to say, look, if, if you can make anxiety go away and a big underscore and live your life wholeheartedly, I say, great, do it. Uh, but most people find that that's not so. Uh, they're actually, the more they don't want the anxiety, the more their lives shrink and uh, the more they suffer. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it doesn't really, it might work in the short term and that's probably why we do it. You know, like avoid here or there and we get a little bit of a honeymoon from the difficulty. But long term, all those little moves pulling out of our lives it, our lives start to shrink. And for many people, that's the worst kind of pain of them all is an unlived life. So we really want to help people avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> that's something to avoid. To avoid, yeah. <laughs> what, what is your philosophy on um, anti-anxiety medication then? Because that's one of the very first things, you know, psychiatrists will send a client to me to work on their anxiety and they'll send them with a prescription for Xanax too. <laughs> and then we're yeah. in a bit of a pickle. So what yeah. is what is your philosophy on that? Okay. I I think like ACT generally, is it's not anti-medication, but I would want to know how somebody's using it. Yeah. Um, so let me give you just an, another example to kind of illustrate that. Like suppose that um, – You've got two people on the at the gym, and they're both on the treadmill for an hour, and they look identical and same pace, same workout routine. And then the first person gets off the treadmill, and you go up and ask them, "Why were you running on the treadmill for an hour?" And they say to you, "I want to be physically fit and healthy so I can live a long life and be there for my kids and live my bucket list and do other things and be productive at work and on and on." And you say, okay, neat. And then the second person gets off and you say, why were you spending an hour on the treadmill? Remember, they look identical. And you and they tell you, uh, I'm there because of the guilt and shame I have because I had a pizza last night and ice cream and I feel fat and I'm so upset and humiliated. I'm trying to work that off. It's a very, the, the behavior looks the same, but the purpose and the meaning behind it is very different. So I would just ask people with medication, you know, sometimes it could be helpful to get people to a place where they can do the work to actually make changes in their lives. But there is no life pill and uh, there is no medication to give people a full rich life. So ultimately, we have to do something new. And if the medication helps people get to a place to start you know, I'm all for it. But if the medication is another clever way to avoid feeling what we feel and thinking what we think, then I think, you know, if it's another tug of war, you know, this time it's like a, it, you come to the tug of war with your medications. This time I'll beat the monster. Then I I would want to explore that a bit more because even the science with uh, with with anxiolytics and antidepressants with anxiety show that none of them stop anxiety for good. Um, there is no pill that will cure anxiety. So people are still somewhat anxious and somewhat depressed when they take the medications. And so I'd really want to explore how they're using it, mm-hmm. you know, just like that treadmill example. And if it's more of that struggle, then 
I'd want to go into that a bit more and see whether in the, in the client's experience, whether that's really worked. Right. So it's, I love that answer because it's a very act consistent answer, which is going back to functionality and context that there isn't, yes. <laughs> there isn't a right or wrong. It's, you've got to look at the context and, and how the functionality of it. So uh, that's very helpful. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little, I'm just so curious for you personally, because you've um, been writing about action in, for a long time and you also uh, lead workshops with your wife and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what it's like for you to, after having done this for 20, you know, 20 years in your own life, how ACT has influenced you personally. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's actually been, a, I think, a game changer that, you know, it's called acceptance and commitment therapy, but I really see this as an approach to living mm -hmm. in a way and an approach that dignifies the human condition. That there's one truth in life, I think, that life invites obstacles, problems, and pain. And there's just no escaping that truth as long as we are alive. But the trick and the skill is how do we navigate that and keep moving forward to make the most out of our time. And so, you know, for me, uh, in, our, in my relationship with my wife, who is also a psychologist, it's, it's sometimes funny because she also practices ACT and we do our, our trainings together. And, you know, I remember just uh, – Oh, a little while back, she had come home from work and she was a little upset about something. And I said, oh, hey, honey, now watch your thoughts. <laughs> like, it's just a thought. And she said, you know, don't pull that act stuff on me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, want, to be, yeah. I want to be angry. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but it was, but then it was, there was humor in the room and humor lightened even her experience and helped her see what thought she was getting hooked on. And so it has... You know, focus on values, focus on um, on practicing, you know, compassion and kindness and being lighter with our thoughts and our feelings, but connected with what we care about individually and together. I think it's made a, a huge difference. And it's helped me through some difficult spots as well. Um, you know, it's, it, I found in my own life that trying to change what I think um, was so effortful and it felt um, disingenuine because if I'm an, a historical creature, like most all of us are as human beings, and my mind and my thoughts are part of my history, going in there and trying to change them and correct them, uh, underneath that effort is the message that it's not okay to think what I think and feel what I feel. And under that is another message, it's not okay to have the history that I already had, and underneath that message is a darker one, which is not okay to be you or to be me, mm -hmm. right? To, to have what I have, my history. And so the, the message of trying to correct and dispute and modify and do all these gymnastics, I found it was incredibly effortful and uh, didn't work all that well and left me feeling worse at times than better. And what ACT did was, I think, really gave me the freedom to notice these thoughts, even some menacing thoughts, um, with a different perspective and a little bit lighter and gentler with myself and more connected, not just to goals and accomplishments and getting things done, but to what I really want to be about as a person what I want my life to be about. And um, that's turned out to be sort of my uh, guiding, guiding beacon. And I'm not perfect at it, <laughs> but it's, it's an ongoing process. But I think it's, it's enriched you know, my life in, in many, many ways. And, uh, and I'm hoping it will do the same for other people as well. Yes, thank you. You can you can see the influences uh, over time just in your writing of compassion in particular uh, in this this latest book. There's a lot there's a lot of reference to self kindness and compassion and practices to increase that as well. And I and I hear that in how you're relating to yourself. Uh, yeah. In, in act as well. And I you know I I think that 
people that are listening and want a, a there's many different ways to go about learning act but i think this this book in particular is one that's really accessible and has very short little passages that you can try on for size because they're so short you can read it and then try it out for a week or so i don't know why you chose 52 but is it related <laughs> to weeks in the year or just that's what you came up with yeah i guess loosely uh weeks in the year and that was mainly because i you know doing anything new can seem backwards and, and challenging at first. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to help people if they want to, to pace it and then to find the exercises or teachings that resonate with them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so like any, any skill we want to learn, it, you know, like riding a bike doesn't happen overnight. It, we, most of us start with training wheels. We take one off and then the other, and then we ride alone and maybe with our hands off the handlebars. And maybe this is something like that, that, a lot of the ideas in the book are not things that come naturally. I think if they did, there'd be no need for a book like this. Um, and I think that you know many of us are brought up in a culture of um, that teaches. Everybody's happy. You need to be happy. If you're not happy, that's a problem, and you need to fix it. And then we start to look at ourselves as a problem if we have painful emotions or if we're unhappy at times. And we start to try to fix ourselves and nobody wants to be a problem to be solved. So the skills, I think, there are different. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, the exercises and teachings, um, because they, they go against the grain of probably what most of us have learned since kindergarten <laughs> about how to manage our emotions in our lives. And... Uh, so yeah, that's and that's why the title is, is appropriate too. If anxiety happens, you know, it's, as opposed to oh no, get rid of my anxiety. It's sort of like it it's gonna show up for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and the other part in there that people will see is it. It's uh, I usually add after that. It's not a choice. You know, I I don't know anybody that chooses anxiety or fear or any other unpleasant emotion. I mean, if it was a choice, nobody would choose it. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I think that's part of it too, is that part of the human condition, you know, I think it's helpful. It's been helpful for me to, you know, as part of the compassion piece you mentioned, Diana, was to, um, to think about all the millions of people, probably since the dawn of time, that have felt what I've felt or thought what I've thought or struggled with what I've struggled with. When you start to put it in that perspective, we start to realize that we're not alone in the pain. And part of the compassion part is to uh, not struggle with that. That very natural and real part of being human is that we will experience painful emotions. And sometimes they're there to alert us to what's wise. Like anxiety might be there to tell you that hey, you're not doing something you care about or you're living somebody else's idea of a life and not your own. Or maybe that you're spending more time in things that don't really matter to you. So even though like we're, t we're kind of like socialized to think of anxiety and fear as a problem, the enemy, unwanted guest, like unwanted house guest, uh, it also may be there to alert us to what's important or to help us pause and take stock and recalibrate mm -hmm. our lives. So there, it's not the enemy. It's actually a teacher, <laughs> you know, if we listen to it that way. Right. So. We get to be the chooser of whether it's helpful or not. Yeah. 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 In our own experience, we can just look at that, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Forsyth. And I want to point people to your website, which has a lot of resources, drjohnforsyth.com, Dr. J-O-H-N-F-O-R-S-Y-T-H.com. That has some of your background as well as links to your upcoming coming trainings. As I mentioned, you'll be up in Big Sur. The California coast is incredible right now in spring. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy that. And, and oh, yeah. Esalen is just amazing. So I, you, you'll, I hope that's a treat for people to go there to see you. And yeah. for those that are interested in Anxiety Happens or some of your other books, I also really like that. Um, on Life Not an Anger book. You can get those all on Amazon and they're also, you can get them through Kindle there uh, as well. And we'll put links to both your website as well as links to all of your resources uh, on the notes of this podcast as well as on our website, which is offtheclockpsych.com. Well, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure and a treat. <laughs> Well, and thank you so much for coming. And we're just very grateful for you sharing all this information with our listeners. And I hope that they find it helpful and 
um, opening a door to maybe relating to their anxiety a little bit differently or working with their clients differently in relationship to anxiety. Oh, well, yeah, thank you so much. And again, you know, if people would like to reach out, they certainly could do th do so to, through my website and send me an email. I'm glad to do what I can to help. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Forsyth. Oh, thank you. Take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes. You can also find us at www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's off the clock, P-S-Y-C-H.com. Music by John Goo and Susie Stevens.